We have a dog treadmill, which was uh, the first stationary belt power developed in the 1800s, late 1800s. And here we have this on a churn. Stationary belt power was used for churning butter, for separating on a cream separator. They had a big flat pulley instead of a little round pulley there. Uh, this one here is a churn also, but it was uh, dog power. They would put a goat in here. A lot of them had goats or sheep buck. But the uh, dogs, uh, by pedaling, they just turned that wheel there. These uh, were quite common in the late 1800s. A lot of them were made on the East Coast at the Vermont Farm Machine Company, for example. Owatonna Manufacturing in Minnesota produced some. I'm from Wisconsin in the Midwest and they were quite common in the late 1800s. Here we have on this trailer four different types of treadmills. We have a uh, circular one that is from Canada and three of the regular dog treadmills. Very desirable as a, for a collection. Uh, Mr. Joe Gomes has got a very pristine collection of treadmills here. And it, usually it seems like these dogs and goats and that really enjoy it. So, okay. we're going to switch treadmills now. You can obviously tell this dog has been on there before. We're going to a treadmill with a big wooden pulley with a eccentric uh, arm on it. And they did have a brake on them. This is a barrel churn. And they would put their milk in here and the butter fat would turn to butter. This is a pristine churn that Mr. Gomes has collected. We're going to a third churn over here. This uh, was replaced by Nordic track for uh, humans to exercise on, but it would sure work for uh, exercising today. We have the dog back here on another one. That is, that is called the first prize dog power. And that one is made by Vermont Farm Machinery in Bellows Falls, Vermont. That is probably the most common one. But these will fetch a very good price. They're very, very, very hard to find. I don't know of any other collector in the United States that has four treadmills. So you're fortunate in uh, California to have this many here. Now we're going to go back to the circular one from Canada. They have versions of these treadmills that are so large you can put a horse on. There's a gas engine show at Masur, Minnesota that has a small threshing machine and they have a big gray horse in a big horse treadmill and they will actually thresh, thrash oats with it in Lesur, Minnesota. Yes. <laughs> if I could have your attention, these treadmills were in the late 1800s, before the, the one lunger, the gas engine. They were the predecessor, and it was stationary belt power. Uh, they had big ones for horses. At Lesur, Minnesota, they have a gas engine show and they have a little old wood thrashing machine for thrashing oats and they have a big gray mare horse, a uh, 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 workhorse that will get in this treadmill and they have enough power that they can, through belt power, they have a big flat belt, they can run this thrashing machine for thrashing oats there and it's really quite interesting. You can't imagine how much power can be generated 
with a belt to run a thrashing machine, but they run this every year at their, their big, uh, it's in September when the oats is ready in Wisconsin and, and Minnesota. But these were very common. As you can see, they did not have longevity because they're made of wood. These are very prized collector's items. Um, this one was made in Ontario, Canada. I know of only two of these to exist. Uh, this is made in Bellows Falls, Vermont by the Vermont Farm Machine Company. They also made separators. Uh, and the other two are various different companies. But these are very sought after for collectors. I know of no other collection that has four. I have owned a number of them in my lifetime, but I've, I've parted with them to other people. But they're very collectible, very rare. You're very fortunate in California to be able to see four treadmills at one time. These were replaced by the gas engine. And uh, that was the progression. After the gas engine, of course, they went to electricity. But the dairy industry uh, started out with treadmills and then went to gas engines. and So it's kind of a neat progression. And you have a beautiful dog, sir. I, he's very well trained. So if there's any questions, I'll be around afterwards if you want to ask me or Mr. Gomes any questions. But this is very, very unique. We have three different, very, very old milking machines here. This first one, these are all hand powered. This is before gas engines or electricity. This first one that Joe was wheeling up is a Bishop Babcock. Bishop Babcock, and that was made in the 1800s. There's very few milkers that are this old. Got to stimulate her. Joe's going to stimulate her a little bit here. Takes like 60 to 90 seconds to get oxytocin to let down. This is a Jersey cow. This Jersey cow is in good shape because she does have some happy lines here, which means she's getting plenty of energy. It may take a little bit to let her oxytocin down here. Pump. Not yet. I'm get we have a glass jar, so if we get any milk, it'll appear in this glass jar. This is a Babcock. Bishop Babcock. Bishop Babcock. Go ahead, Paul, slowly. We do have a little fluid coming, but I think it's rinsing out the lines so it's brown. I don't think our vacuum is perfected here yet. Well, you can see how primitive these first inventions were. Hey, she's already milked. And they did, they did the... Now the second one we're going to... Oh, that's just for Yeah. This is a Mering milker. And this is also from the late 1800s. And uh, this one isn't as rare as that one. There are a few of these around. There's the... There's the cap off the other one. But this one you pump by your feet. <laughs> Where's Donnie? He's right here. That's low butter fat though. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. That's Holstein milk. <laughs> you sit on that and you work that. And this is called a mirroring milker. I'm going to move this towards you. I want to move it towards you. Oh, there you go. This again is a very rare milker. There probably aren't more than six of these in existence in the United States. Um, there was one of these that was just sold through our cream separator group. We have a newsletter and a lady called in and had one of these and I ran an ad in our newsletter and it got sold uh, for very good money because these are museum pieces. Um, the North American Dairy Foundation is collectors like Joe and myself and a hundred plus other people across the United States and we have a newsletter where we correspond and we have an annual convention which you're hosting this year in Hillmar. <laughs> he needs a cup holder for, for the beer. Was that built here in the U.S.? Yes. Yes. Well, there's milk dripping. It got some. This is a hand forged piece. Um, these did not hang around real long because they were replaced with. Uh, The more modern ones. Now this is a McCartney milker. Uh, this one here was made in the early, early 1900s. Uh, and this is patented both in the United States and Canada. You want to come to there, I bet. I'll hold it. Well, Gene, you want to pump this slowly? About this way? Can you reach it? Yeah. Donnie, you over there? The vacuum cylinders are in here. This is also a very rare milker, the McCartney. Okay, Gene. Now you can see we got vacuum in this one here. You got one cylinder that's working with vacuum. This one milker. One, the other is a two. It's a two cow milker. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a two cow milker. You could have another set of teat cups on this vacuum here. I can feel the vacuum on this left side. Yeah, I can feel it. Too. Yeah. It pumping it, it got yeah. <laughs> These old milkers were very, uh, very ingenious. Took some real engineering to figure this out. Looks like we got enough there for a sweet bread. Small sweet bread. Don't slow till 15 years ago we broke the handle off of I know the guys at Hillmark Cheese, they grabbed it and got out there and started going like this. Yes, broke the handle right off. How you doing? How'd you do that job? <laughs> <laughs> this one is your big video tape. When is milk? When is milk the cleanest? While it's still in the cow. When they leave the dairy. <laughs> oh, listen to him brag. <laughs> That's the cleanest. It'll never get any cleaner. When it right when it comes out of the end of the teat, it's the cleanest. Yes. From, Yes. It's getting heavy, Joe. It's getting heavy, huh? Uh, I got them both hooked on because you're killing milk on one glass. It's a two-cow milker. Oh, that's a two-cow milker. It's a two-cow milker. Oh, yeah. oh it's a two-cow milker. Oh, somebody's sorry. We do have some milk to drink here, but not from her. Over in the tub, there's some milk, compliments of Organic Valley. 
And I see we have an Organic Valley milk, a farmer in the crowd. So we're donating part of his equity to you today. <laughs> You got it now? We want it inside on the stage. There will be a demonstration in the stage on separating if we have enough milk. Joe's we got 10 gallons of milk getting delivered right now from a dairy. Inside. Okay. We have something I've never ever seen. At, uh, and I've been all over the U.S. and to many, many collectors, but Joe Pedro here has got a device that I thought he was joking about. But it is, believe it or not, this is a chastity belt for cows. <laughs> and uh, we have kind of figured it out. See that? Thank you, Frank. That would probably deter a bull. <laughs> and so, there's no manufacturer on it, but you can tell it's old. Um, you know where you got this, Joe? A veterinarian gave it to him. Okay. A doc, just like you. Very good. Well, I've been a veterinarian for 47 years and I've never seen one. <laughs> probably came from Portugal. Probably there. <laughs> anyway, I thought we'd show you this. This is a very unique item. I can't use the morning after because I have to use that. Yes. <laughs> this is before the advent of hormones. <laughs> okay, we're going in next. Yeah. I assembled this uh, Malat milker. It's a new machine to me. It's not a milk, it's a cream separator. What I've done. I've been drinking too much milk. Maybe it's the organic milk that I'm drinking too much of. I, uh, I covered up the cream tube. Did we get that on? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Now you're going to go. And we don't turn the milk on until you get it really going and start it slow. I purchased this milker, I mean this cream separator from Mr. Charles Jent. Charles Jent is the operator right now. He's turning the handle. He lives in uh, Eugene, Oregon. I just purchased this a couple of months ago, so I haven't had a chance to operate it. So he, uh, he told me I had the brake on. So now I know when there's a brake on. So get it up to speed and you'll turn the, turn the milk on. And Joe, when, will, when was this being used? Uh, how long ago were these in working? These were used from These machines were used from about 1880 to about 1930. Um, early on there was only creameries, there was not milk plants, they only, could only buy 
Melon from a dairy dairy magician providing milk and bottles for people. Uh, then the previous turned into milk plants and uh, creamery used to only buy cream. This is about a 1920 model. This machine was made in Belgium, imported to the U.S. by Serge Babcock, brother of uh, Bishop Bad uh, Babcock, Stephen Babcock and his sons. They uh, imported separators from Belgium. That's what this machine did. Pilevald made their own in the U.S. and several other companies as well. Yep. We'll try it one more time, but we are having a trouble with this being one level. Malat was made in Belgium and Surge brought them in. The forerunners of Surge were Babson brothers. And her manager was Henry B. Babson. Where'd they come from? And they came from Belgium. They were imported. And this bowl hangs on a spindle. It's a, it just hangs and it's got to be absolutely level or it wobbles. And that's our problem here in that we do not have a firm solid base. Most of these are floor models. And if you don't have them perfectly level, even in a floor model, that bowl can take off. These bowls spin at like five to 7,000 RPMs and they're heavy and it's like a missile in orbit if they ever come out of there. We're getting less wobble now. That bowl is controlled by a bunch of strings with a rubber up on top here. And these strings are probably very old. But I think we should let some milk in now and see if we got it. We are going to run cream on the floor. We do have some skim milk coming out here and there will be some cream in a little bit. And there's always a cream setting. Oh, now we're... we're getting a wobble again. We've got a lot of milk in there, none of it's come out yet. Yep. I don't think we got it. Now the cream is coming out. You can definitely see the cream is darker. They built a plant in Poughkeepsie, New York, and they started out with what's called the Alpha Series. And they patented the conical disc, and they held that patent until 1906. So previous to 1906, you had all types of innovative devices, like Sharples had a long tube, that rotated at 17,000 RPM and your cream is heavier so it would throw the cream to the outside and the skim milk is lighter. It all was based on centrifugal force and your 
Skim milk would go to the middle and it would come out the big spout. The cream would was heavier and go to the outside and come out the cream spout. After 1906, the majority of the early separator companies adapted the cone disc that Patrick D. Lavelle invented because it was more efficient. Even in your creameries today at Hillmar up here, when they separate, if they separate the cream off, which they don't do because they're in the cheese business, but if you're a creamery, you still separate with the Alpha Cone Disc. That's never been improved upon. Did you want the milk into this one? I, that's up to Joel. That one he has never tried. That one we may just explain. This, this separator on the right over here is a Sharples. This was made in the early, early 1900s. And they could not, they had a cylinder in here, but they were the first Sharples to put a disc in here. This is called a number two. This is a very, very, very rare piece. There's only two of these known to exist in the United States. Sharples was made in Westchester, Pennsylvania by a gentleman by the name of Sharples. And they sold them exclusively out east. Sharples are a very, very good find for a separator collector. They're kind of the, the Cadillac of collecting. This one has never been used. I don't know if we're going to separate with it, but I did want to tell you about it. Um, Joe has uh, hundreds of separators in his collection, and the rarer the better. The dairy industry had two significant things that happened that took it out of subsistence agriculture. My forefathers came out of Germany and settled in Wisconsin in 1848, and they milked cows by hand in all these little communities. Minnesota was settled quite extensively after the Civil War. They got 160 acres and everybody had a cow. And two things happened that took dairying from subsistence agriculture to a income, and that was the invention of the cream separator, where they could separate and sell cream. The other thing that happened was the formation of co-ops. The first co-op in Minnesota happened to be formed at Litchfield, Minnesota, and it was called Lando Lakes, which is in existence today. And the co-op gave the marketing arm to subsistence agriculture. I was born in a little town called Grand Meadow, Minnesota, and we had a creamery there that made butter. It was on the railroad, and the Grand Meadow co-op sent their butter to Boston, Massachusetts. And there was the formation of this co-op and the cream separator that gave the farmer a, new, a milk check every two weeks. And that was the dawn of the dairy industry in America, was the cream separator and the cooperative. And it's that way today. Dairying is two things, it's production, agriculture, and marketing. And they are totally different, so. Thank you, we'll be around to answer any questions.